everybody and welcome. This is the first video in my series that's going to be covering a lot of the finer details of vocal recording and production, especially as it relates to pop vocals and K-pop vocals. This series is going to take you guys inside of what goes into recording all of your favorite groups, kind of give you a behind the scenes and in-studio look at how everything works. I have most of the same elements and software and everything else that professional studios in Korea or in the United States are using to record pop or K-pop music. So I can show you guys some of the top methods that are used in the industry. Just keep in mind that not everybody does things the exact same way. So even if I show a technique of how to do something, that doesn't necessarily mean that a certain K-pop artist used it on a certain song. They may have gotten the same result differently, but the methods that I will be showing you guys are definitely used by professionals in the industry. And it's very likely that most of them or some variation on those techniques have been used in the songs that you know and love. Another reason why I'm doing this series is that when I mention some of these techniques, I want you guys to know exactly what I'm talking about in my reaction and review videos. So if I build up a library of all these different super detailed vocal techniques and recording techniques, I can always send you guys here and reference them so you'll know what I'm talking about in the future. And hopefully it'll also make you a more informed consumer of music if you don't have any recording experience of your own. Hopefully you'll be able to get a good idea of how a lot of this music is made. And although some people think that if you kind of show what's going on behind the curtain, it ruins some of the magic, I don't believe that at all. I think if everyone knew how music was recorded and how difficult it can be and how much love and care and work goes into all these songs that you're hearing for, you know, three and a half minutes on the radio or on YouTube, I think it really increases the amount of magic that you're seeing happening and it will let you admire your favorite artists even more for what they do. So with all that out of the way, this is the first video in the vocal production and recording series. So what's the first thing that happens anytime you want to record vocals for a song or really anything? You have to have a microphone and you have to have some way to record it. So this video is going to cover microphones a little bit. It's going to show how they're set up and just give you a really solid idea of that first step in a long line of things that has to happen to get a fully finished polished vocal that you hear on the radio. So the first thing we want to do is record a pop vocal part. Obviously the thing, the device that captures the sound coming out of the human body, coming out of your mouth, you know, resonating through your vocal cords and out into the air where the sound propagates. The device that captures that sound, it catches it as it's going out into the room and transfers it into an electrical signal is called a microphone. Now, there are a lot of different kinds of microphones. I mean, you've probably seen something kind of like both of these. This type of microphone is a dynamic microphone. They're usually handheld. You'll see people using them live. You'll see people using them at karaoke stuff, you know. These are generally used more for live vocals because they're a lot more uh, durable, they're easier to carry around, and they're a lot less delicate than this type of microphone, and this is a condenser microphone. Basically how a condenser mic operates is that it has a very, very thin membrane that's usually made of something like mylar that's been coated with a super thin layer of something metallic like gold, and this super thin material is stretched and suspended on a circular frame. And basically when sound waves hit it, it causes very small pressure changes in that membrane which is extremely sensitive. And so those sound waves, those pressure waves hitting the membrane result in very small voltage differences. So this microphone, like all other microphones, transfers sound waves hitting it into a very small electrical signal which can then be sent out and amplified to be recorded. And generally condensers are extremely sensitive. They have a sound that's preferable for vocals. So usually some sort of condenser mic is used on pop vocals almost all the time. There are some dynamic mics that do get used in pop vocals, uh, like the Shure SM7 has been used on some legendary pop tracks, reportedly on some Michael Jackson tracks back in the 80s, and obviously those sounded really, really good. So it does come down to what sounds best on the singer who's standing in front of the mic, but most often, in most cases, condenser mics are used on pop vocals. Now, there is a third kind of microphone, which is called a ribbon mic. It works a little bit different than either a condenser or a dynamic mic. Those generally aren't used as much on vocals unless you're looking at like 1940s American recordings. Then you'll definitely see and hear some ribbon mics being used on vocals. Um, and I have seen a couple K-pop groups using modern ribbon mics on vocal recordings for some live stuff, like in-studio live performances. So they might be making a little bit of a comeback, but again, generally some sort of condenser mic is the go-to mic for pop vocals for both male and female. And of course, like anything else, there are a whole bunch of different choices when it comes to condenser mics. Both of these are condenser mics. This is a rather cheap one, but it sounds very nice on female vocals as I've found. 
This is kind of a medium expensive microphone. It sounds pretty good on a lot of different things, including male vocals. Then if we grab this microphone, this is what we would call a high-end or a professional kind of top shelf mic. No, this is not the most expensive mic that you can get at all, but it is kind of in that top class of very expensive, very good microphones. And anything kind of in that upper echelon or that upper category is generally a really good microphone and it just comes down to like taste and what sounds good on what particular singer. Another thing that I should mention is that there are two basic kinds of condenser mics. This is a solid state condenser mic, meaning the circuitry that amplifies that little voltage signal from the capsule is made with solid state parts, you know, transistors, that type of thing. And this microphone here is actually a tube condenser mic, meaning that at least one of the amplification stages in the circuit actually utilizes a tube. And for the kids out there, you may have never seen an electrical device that had a tube in it, but they used to be in TVs and radios. And it's basically what people used for amplification before we had smaller solid state uh, transistors to amplify things. Tubes are still used though in audio applications, in really expensive stereos, in guitar amps, that's a big place where they're used, and also in some microphones. And again, that variation just gives these two mics very different sound, just like their capsules give them different sound. And that's something I do want to stress. Microphones have their own sound. They're going to make whatever's going into them sound a particular way. They're going to color that sound a certain amount. Some microphones color things very, very little. They don't impart much tone on the source. Some microphones color things a lot and really change the sound or smooth out the sound or make vocals sound you know, bigger or larger than life, that type of thing. So again, it all comes down to taste, matching up the right microphone with what's going to sound good on that particular singer's voice. Because everyone's voice is different, and every different model of microphone sounds different as well. So you have to match those two things to get the best result that you possibly can. So the first thing the producer or engineer needs to do is select the microphone. And a lot of times you'll do like some tests with the singer, you know, singing into three or four different mics and then kind of pick the best one. I've already done that a lot, so I'm selecting the best microphone that I own, which is the Sound Deluxe U195. And this is actually a really early first production run model, so the capsule is a little bit different. I really like how it sounds and it really complements my kind of lower sounding voice very, very well. This microphone might not be a very good choice for, say, a female vocalist with a really high voice because it really accentuates the low end of my voice and kind of tames some of the mid-range frequencies that can get a little bit obnoxious when you're recording things. But for a female vocalist, this mic might be sort of taming out some of the low end of her voice that she really needs to give it a boost and have her voice sound really full and rich. Again, you just have to test each particular mic with each particular singer. So I've selected this mic, and this is the shock mount that actually comes with it. And you can see it's suspended on these little rubber band type things. So this will hopefully dampen any sort of noise or rumble coming from the floor or bumping the mic stand because these mics are so super sensitive. They pick up everything. I mean, you can almost hear someone's heartbeat from outside of their body. You can hear every little breath or smack of their lips or anything else going on if you crank the gain up. So that's why most condenser mics come with some sort of shock mount. This one does look a little strange. A lot of times you'll see ones that have like a... Uh, sort of truss system around it with like a kind of a bigger cage thing around the microphone but this is the one that comes with this particular mic. So basically for this mic it drops down in and you just tighten this little screw here that holds the mic down. You gotta make sure that the capsule is facing you the correct way. I know on this mic because the logo faces the axis that you want a singer to sing into. So basically I've lined up the logo here with how I'm going to be singing directly into it and generally you want to sing directly on axis into most microphones. That's usually how it's done. And that's the other thing about microphones. They have different pickup uh, patterns. A mic like this is called a cardioid pickup pattern. And it's basically a shape like this. It picks up sound mostly from straight on. And it picks up sound a little bit less, a little bit less. And it doesn't really pick up a whole lot of sound in back. That's the cardioid pickup pattern. Um, another pattern that's sometimes used on vocals would be the Omni pickup pattern, which basically picks up uh, sound equally from all around the mic. And if you're going for a really intimate vocal, or if you don't want to get the proximity effect as much on a vocalist, we'll talk about that a little bit later, then Omni is a pickup pattern that you can use. But this mic actually doesn't have that mode available. This is just a single pickup pattern microphone, so you need to sing directly on axis, and the capsule is right in here facing at me, so I sing into it and it picks up my voice. 
Most studio microphones or professional microphones use an XLR connector. It's a three pin connector. It usually has a latch on it. Um, you basically line up the pins with the bottom of the mic, snap it in, and I'm going to engage the phantom power on my preamp. Phantom power is 48 volts that's sent out to the microphone to help run the internal amplification system to get those tiny voltages coming from the capsule up to a place where they can be sent out at an appropriate level and impedance where the mic preamp can actually pick it up and you don't get a lot of noise in the signal. Again, I'm not going to focus on the electrical engineering end of things. I went a little bit into that in this video, but I do want to focus more on the music making end of things, so we won't get so much into that, but feel free to ask about it in the comment section. Now, like I was mentioning before, these microphones are extremely, extremely sensitive. So the next critical thing that you probably want is a pop filter or a windscreen. That's what this thing is, if you can see it. It's basically a really thin layer of like nylon or it's actually basically pantyhose material. You can actually make these out of pantyhose if you don't want to buy one. Um, but it's a very thin layer of nylon and what it does is when you're singing into it and you make like a P sound, make a P sound and put your hand out in front of it, you'll feel air blowing out. If that air hits the capsule of this microphone, there's going to be a huge and like a pop thumping sound. This windscreen lets the sound of your voice carry through without that big and you know wind sound that hits the capsule and it'll ruin any take on the recording that you're doing. The other thing that the windscreen does is that it keeps spit from hitting your microphone and if your microphones cost more than your car, spit and moisture can damage them. So again, it's just a nice safety feature to have. The other thing that the uh, windscreen does you can set it you know, in different places. So if you don't want your vocalist really close up to the microphone, um, you want them to stay back here, you can set the windscreen back and it'll basically act as a fence or a barrier so they can't get any closer to the microphone. And that can be an issue with some singers that really like to move around, maybe like the Christina thing, you know, and they're really dramatic when they sing. That looks really cool on video, but it's awful trying to record unless the singer really knows what they're doing with mic management because a lot of times it'll just sound like they're getting much louder and much quieter in all the wrong places. So anyway, I've got my mic set up here. It's running into a preamp, which is running into my audio interface and right into Pro Tools. And Pro Tools is the software that's pretty much the global standard. I know there are some studios that don't use it. There are some producers that don't use it, actually quite a few, but Pro Tools overall still has like the biggest market share. If you go into pretty much any big professional studio, especially like in K-pop, Every single one that I've seen or everybody I've talked to, they're using Pro Tools primarily for recording. All right, so since I have everything set up here, I'm going to go ahead and switch over to the audio coming from my microphone. Okay, ready? Here's camera audio. Here's microphone audio. Pretty big difference, don't you think? And you notice if I'm talking like this and I turn away, it gets much quieter because these microphones are very sensitive, but they're also very directional. So, like I was saying before, you want to be directly lined up with the microphone. You want to have it approximately at mouth level. Sometimes you want to tilt it down to get some more of the chest sound, you know, the resonation coming off your throat and your chest when you're singing. Uh, sometimes you want to tilt it up, probably not very often because you tend to get more of a nasal sound, um, you know, the sound that's resonating through your sinuses and down through your nose. Um, but this is kind of a good happy medium. If I'm sitting up straight, it's at the proper level. And as you guys can hear, this microphone sounds a lot different than my camera microphone that's built in and is a really kind of crappy microphone. So we picked our microphone, we've got the windscreen set up, and we want to record a pop song. So do we just start recording or what do we do? Actually, another thing that's extremely important, like I was just mentioning with mic placement, is the singer placement um, and distance from the microphone. A good place to be is about eight inches to a foot away from the microphone. That's kind of a good happy medium ground. If you go further, you know, you tend to get more room sound and usually you get more noise in your recordings. Generally, unless you have a really good sounding live room in your studio, you probably don't want to do that as much. And as you get closer, you might notice that the sound changes a little bit. Obviously it gets louder, but it does sound more intimate. So maybe for like a K-pop ballad for like an OST, we'd have the singer up really close and singing really breathy and being very dramatic like this. And maybe if we're doing, you know, a song like Why So Serious by Shiny, we got everybody just yelling and singing really loud, we might want them a little bit further away so they're not overblowing and distorting the capsule and the microphone. 
Now, a big part of this video series that I definitely want to incorporate are these types of demonstrations where I can literally let you guys hear things while I'm showing you and uh, demonstrate a lot of different things. So obviously you'll notice that the sound of the mic changes quite a bit also, not just the volume, but the actual tone of the mic changes as I get closer. So I want to put it really close here and I want to talk like this. Do you guys notice something here? You notice how my voice sounds a lot bigger? Now, I'm obviously talking like a radio announcer, and you can tell that my voice is kind of shot right now because I've talked a lot today, but isn't it amazing how I can almost sound like the movie guy if I talk really close to the microphone? This is what I'm talking about when I refer to the proximity effect. With cardioid microphones, unless they have a built-in compensation system, usually when you get really close to the microphone, it enhances the low end of your voice, which radio guys use all the time to make their voices sound really big. You know, and they really accentuate how they talk into the microphone to take advantage of that. But a lot of times when you're singing something, you don't want a singer to sound ridiculous like that. Sometimes you need to thicken up someone's voice if it's a little thin on the low end. But a lot of times you want a more natural singing sound. And that's why you keep from, you know, about six inches to a foot away. And you tend to avoid the proximity effect so much if you do that. So now you know what the proximity effect is. It is something that's kind of fun if you want to take advantage of it or be like a radio DJ. Obviously, it's something that you don't probably want to use as much when you're recording music. Now, just to demonstrate to you guys how sensitive this microphone is. Do you hear that? Do you hear that? This microphone is incredibly sensitive and I don't even have the gain on my preamp turned up very much at all. I could turn it way up to the point where my voice would actually be distorting even at normal discussion level, but all of the little sounds around my room you'd be able to hear. Actually, I'm sure you guys can probably hear my computer fans in the background because this mic does such a great job at picking up sound from all over the room that you're in. So we've covered the proximity effect, we've covered distance, microphone placement, all of those things. And basically then after this part, it comes down to singing and performing the actual parts, doing multiple takes usually, uh, multiple layers, harmonies, everything else. The singer will be working with the engineer and the producer to try to get the absolute best performance that they can. And this is kind of the first step in the giant journey that is a finished, polished pop song with really nice vocal recordings. Now I do want to demonstrate something else. If I say things like P's and T's, P's and T's, those kind of harsh consonant syllables, you can tell that it doesn't really have any wind sound, but listen to what happens if I get rid of the pop filter. P's and T's, P's and T's, P's and T's. Those harsh consonant sounds really come out and you hear the wind noise in the microphone. And as you can tell, that really would ruin a vocal take. You couldn't have that in a professionally produced song. It'd sound really amateurish and terrible. So anyway, that kind of wraps up the very, very basics on microphone placement, uh, microphone selection, the different types of microphones. And it's really the first thing that interacts with someone's voice after it leaves their body and goes out into the room or goes out into the world for everybody to enjoy. So the microphone is an incredibly, incredibly influential an important part of that chain in contributing to the final sound. Probably second only to the singer's voice, the microphone has the most influence based on its positioning, the room it's in, and then the inherent tonal qualities that it's gonna impart on that person's voice. So it's very, very important. It needs to be a very high quality device. And that's why you'll see microphones that cost as much or maybe more than like your car. It's that ridiculous and they're that important. And professional studios will actually happily spend that money and invest in quality microphones that they think will make their clients sound as good as they possibly can. So I know I did skip over some things that was on purpose. Um, I'm trying to give you guys all of the most important little bits of information that I can about this part of the subject. Uh, later on, we're going to get into other things like preamps, signal processing, especially um, different effects, EQ, compression, all those things that are done to the vocal after it's recorded. We're going to get into those. Um, show you guys actual screen grabs from Pro Tools as I'm working on stuff so you can hear it as you're seeing me do all those different tasks. But obviously you have to start somewhere. This is how the sound actually gets from the air or from someone's vocal cords into the computer, onto tape, whatever kind of recording system you're using. Usually it's computer, digital based nowadays. And so now hopefully you have a better idea about all this stuff. Uh, please leave a comment in the comment section if there's anything more in particular that you'd like to see, if you have any questions about anything I said, or if you'd like me to cover something more. Uh, again, be very specific. I'll try to cover everything that you guys want to know about and be looking out for the next video in this series sometime soon. Thanks for watching. I'll see you guys next time.